Hi guys, my name's Andrew, and I'm going to tell you today how real life tech made personalization a core part of our product and give you some practical tips on how to find the data that you need to pay attention to when working on your own products. First, just a little bit about me. I'm a user interface and user experience designer originally from the Bahamas, um, but I've been designing stuff for 20 years. I'm currently the head of design at Real Life Tech in London, um, and I help some of the world's largest brands, sports teams, and venues connect with their fans through personalized, responsive experiences. Personalization is an incredibly powerful user experience. Big brands like Spotify, Google, and Amazon use it every day to keep us glued to their products. And the way that Real Life Tech arrived at personalization was organic, but also hard fought. A few years ago, we were engaged in multiple discovery processes and interviews with key clients, one of whom was a well-known London-based football club with a new stadium that was about to open. Over the course of six months, we spent time with every stakeholder at the club. Many people from many departments told us what they wanted to do and who they wanted to cater for. They had lots of helpful user personas that we could use, but every department had different personas and different needs for the types of users that they specifically cared about. Marketing wanted to make sure their promotions and products were shown to the right people. The transport team wanted to make sure it was easy to get to and from the stadium on match days, but on non-match days, there were different requirements. The content team wanted to make sure all the news scores and other important information was always up to date and also region specific. The tech team wanted to make sure we used their single sign-on to kind of identify their users across all their different channels. The ticketing team wanted to make sure that tickets inside the app were easy to get to on match day, but on non-match days were safely tucked away. And the website team wanted to be able to update their website and the app with one single process. How could we cater for all of these different stakeholders and all of these different users at the same time? After a lot of time researching and collecting data, the sheer amount of information we had to work with was quite overwhelming, but a pattern was starting to emerge. Look, it's easy for product processes to overlook the role of customer insight to inform them. Using just pure research to evaluate an idea can cause problems late in the innovation process, and the sunk cost fallacy can make it hard to back out and start again. Customer insight and context needs to be part of the process from the beginning. Research and data can indicate a behavior or a need, but data alone isn't enough. Lots of data can sometimes just be lots of noise. But how do you find the signal in all of that noise? Human-centered design requires an understanding of the people that you're trying to reach so that you can design from their perspective. Not keeping this in mind can lead you to create something because you can rather than because it's useful. Our product team needed to advance the product and we needed to show value to our clients. And because the design team was heavily involved in this process, we were able to contribute meaningfully in providing stakeholders with the user experience they hadn't considered in all of their requests. And this would ultimately be more beneficial than the things that they thought they needed. So here's how we did it. Keep everyone involved. Can't stress this enough. The best way to break down barriers between teams is not to have any. Everyone in the product team brought their own unique experience and expertise to the group. Engineering could help assess technical viability and complexity. Product managers could make sure everything was captured, categorized, and checked against existing features. Customer success could give us valuable insight into the nuances of the client relationship and give important context to their requests. Project managers kept us focused and on track and of course, designers were synthesizing all of these inputs and advocating for the end user. And also reminding everyone that, you know, design isn't just how something looks, it's also how it works. Also, keep an open mind. Don't be super specific in your interviews. Influence comes from a huge range of directions. And unless you keep your mind open, you're never going to go to unexpected places. Context is everything when trying to understand stakeholders and users. 
Our foot at our football client, we interviewed many stakeholders in each of their departments as possible. We asked them generalized questions about what the experience was they wanted to provide and who those experiences would best serve. Having the standard set of questions helped us to unpack, categorize, and compare the answers later. When we started looking at possible solutions, there were many ways we could go, and our trove of interview answers really helped us to put ourselves in the stakeholder's shoes and recognize the differences between them all. Having so many different points of view really helped us to look at ideas from different angles and organize brainstorming sessions with stakeholders where we could exchange ideas and try new things. Be prepared to kill your darlings, guys. I tell this to my design team all the time. Don't let your biases or personal preference keep you from reaching the ultimate solution. Having strong opinions is great and preferable, but don't hold on to them too tight. Hold on to them loosely. Be willing to change your mind when presented with helpful information that's counter to your own belief. This will serve you well in product design and in life. In the earlier stages of our project, it was a lot easier to stay detached and iterate. And as time goes on, this became harder because of many factors, including being in love with your own ideas. Our first proposal for a solution to our client was ultimately rejected. And after some soul searching, we realized we had put a lot of effort into putting something forward that would be really good for us and our platform, but wasn't gonna meet the needs of our clients and our users. It was humbling and honestly, slightly embarrassing to be given this news by stakeholders that we were working so closely with. We tried selling the client our own self-serving ideas, and now we needed to let go of that and serve the users. We had to swallow our pride and put the users above everything else. Designing for the future is hard, especially when you're also designing for the present. And unfortunately, stakeholders can't always tell you what they're gonna to want tomorrow. However, if you keep at it, you can pick up valuable clues as to where you can evolve things. This will let you design something with a solid idea of how it can evolve over time. Our stakeholders were asking us for lots of different things, and we were realizing we couldn't please all of them individually. So instead of catering just for the stakeholders, we focused really hard on the users and found that if we built a flexible system with some sort of governance, we'd be able to achieve our goals and enable the stakeholders to achieve theirs. When coming up with this new solution, after we had proposed a clanger, um, we came up with a system of governance for the product that would start off with just a few simple rules. And we knew that over time, we could just add new rules when new projects required it without rethinking everything every time we had a new requirement to cater for. Improvisation, adaptation, and the ability to overcome is really important. The data that you need to execute your solution it's gonna yo-yo over time. To start with, you're gonna need a lot more qualitative insight at the beginning, but as time goes on, you'll need to do smaller bouts of additional in interviews and research, then move quickly to test, refine, and optimize so you don't paralyze the whole process. Making lots of micro decisions for our client was easier than making huge sweeping ones. The data and the work we were now doing was working well, but we topped up on details with key clients and internal stakeholders to make sure that we were solving the right problems at the right time. With so many stakeholders involved, we had to be really nimble, moving quickly, adapting to requests and validating ideas with key stakeholders at every step of the way so we wouldn't get derailed. Project management helped schedule twice weekly catch-ups. And once we got into a rhythm, it was easy to iterate, present and sense check our ideas with everyone involved. The frequency of these catch-ups also provided good motivation to quickly iterate ahead of the next call and not get too attached to your ideas. Using those ideas is really how we made it work. Our sports and entertainment venue apps aren't in constant use like Instagram or TikTok or Facebook. Our users engage with our products during a few key touch points while doing some sort of real life activity. And we want to be able to respond to them better. We needed to use our product um, to make sure that we catered for their needs and personalization was really going to enable that. Because we kept an open mind, we were able to see that the only way to success was to be really flexible, to build a system that could adapt to different contexts and serve different audiences within those contexts. We made every corner of our app dynamic so it could be updated by anyone at any time. We also introduced this idea of context that would govern all of the dynamic content and show the right thing to the right person at the right time. 
that this system was built in a way that we could add to it over time. Because we had one eye on the future and this system was built to change over time, this en enabled us to make it the cornerstone of our user experience. And we're still building on top of this personalization engine today. This isn't what our stakeholders were exactly asking us for, but what we delivered was a solution that would enable many other future solutions. Something that was above and beyond expectations and something that would be a unique selling point for our products. So to wrap things up, keep an open mind. The answers you're looking for are everywhere and keeping an open mind gives you a better chance of spotting them and acting on them. Kill your darlings, guys. Have strong but loosely held opinions. Have one eye in the present, one eye in the future. Leave hooks in your ideas for future improvement. The present you can help future you a lot more than you think. Improvise, adapt, and overcome. Don't try to do too much all at once. Short, focused bursts help you iterate quickly and understand the value of your ideas. And while all of this is going on, keep everyone involved. Use the strength of each discipline involved in product decisions to your advantage and keep communication open, honest, and constructive. Well, that's it for me for now. I hope you enjoyed this short talk and I can't see what you do next with your own products.